So what I'll be looking at this morning is biosecurity, uh, which involves a lot of risk management. And as you can see by the graphic depicted here, the gentleman is looking at all of these complex equations, trying to make sense of all of this complexity. And this is very similar to what is going on right now with the current COVID-19 pandemic and what faces us in the future as well, not only in the Caribbean, but also uh, globally as well. So this presentation will touch on what is biosecurity. It will look at risk communication, complexity of biosecurity systems, best field analysis, which is a tool that we've developed here at the Center for Biosecurity Studies, and also look at a qualitative analysis of COVID-19 in the Caribbean and in Barbados, and how we can close gaps and leverage the available opportunities to save lives and livelihoods. Now, the traditional view of biosecurity looks at, in some cases, food, food safety, animal life, plant life, and human life and health, and the associated risk for the environment. And this is by the FAO and the World Health Organization. However, uh, given the advent of this current pandemic, we recognize that there are a number of issues with this particular definition. And so we've sought to redefine biosecurity. And we've gone back to the rudimentary roots of the word, looking at the prefix and the suffix. And from bio, you get the Greek word bios, which means one life. And from security, it is derived from the Latin, the Latin word securus, which means freedom from anxiety. And when you put both of them together, you get one life with freedom from anxiety. So we've redefined biosecurity as the science and practice of safeguarding lives and livelihoods. And this is done through the reduction of systematic vulnerabilities of biological ecosystems. And we have the really unique context of the Caribbean, which has a number of different biosecurity threats, natural disasters, narco-trafficking, cybercrime, and human trafficking. So let us look at the main biosecurity risk factors, and there are three of them. Um, you have the human risk factor, and this includes you know, the social environment. This includes human behavior, because human beings are a big part of the problem, but they're also a big part of the solution. We also have the environment, which can be abiotic factors such as climate. Within the Caribbean, climate change is one of, if not the most important external factor that um, impacts lives and livelihoods in this region. And you also have obviously wildlife and vermin and mosquitoes, et cetera. But also important is infrastructure. And this could be non-physical or physical. So buildings, um, homes, you have farms, you have you know, even vehicles and uh, airplanes. All of these are physical infrastructure, but you also have the non-physical infrastructure. And this can be also, for instance, you know, your legislative infrastructure or your social infrastructure. So these all combine and contribute to uh, biosecurity risk. Now, what is also very important with biosecurity is risk communication. And risk communication is forward-looking in that it identifies in advance situations where decision-making is required in the face of uncertainty. So with respect to this, this concept of biosecurity, you have very good risk analysis in the context of COVID being done. We have a number of different studies, well, well designed and well executed. However, the challenge re remains how do you effectively communicate this risk to the population? And this is where media comes into play. This could be social media, this could be print, this could be T television or radio, but this is a crucial, crucial focal point for the communication of risk to the people that you need to understand what those risks are so that they can change their behavior to reduce the risk and reduce vulnerability. Okay, so this is the tool that we've develop at the center and it's called the pest heal tool and what it looks at is different lenses through which we can see biosecurity. You know, the previous or traditional view of biosecurity looks mainly at the health and the environment which constitute the one health approach. However, we see the need to expand that approach to include the political, the economic, social, technological, ethics and also the legal aspects which came to the poor with COVID-19. 
And what we're currently um, doing at the center is trying to quantitatively um, define biosecurity risk. Um, we are not completed it at present. Um, this particular presentation will be focusing on a more qualitative analysis, but this particular framework we believe allows us to assess, mitigate, manage, and prevent vulnerabilities to major biosecurity threats by driving multi-disciplinary um, approach that will foster cross collaboration, systems thinking to comprehensive, to generate comprehensive and inclusive solutions to save life and livelihoods. So let's get into the analysis with the politics and, the, and governance. And one key metric that is used all around the globe is global health, the global health security index or the GHS index. And the graphic to the left shows you the 2019 um, result for countries. And this is just a index that shows the level of preparation of countries to deal with the pandemic. And as you can see, right number one and two would be the US and the UK. Um, but with the evolution of the current pandemic, we saw that these two countries did not perform as well as some of the other lower ranked countries. And one of the key critical um, reasons for this was the political risk. So the political risk needs to be featured in these types of assessments to be able to accurately assess the uh, preparation of these countries for the emergence of another pandemic. And the bottom right graphic shows you the 2021 Global Health Security Index. And it shows us that on, on the global average, the world is ill prepared to prevent another pandemic. And so we need a stronger political will to shore up the existing uh, biosecurity systems, not only in Barbados and the Caribbean, but also globally as well. Now, looking at the economics of it, this graphic shows you the different scenarios as it relates to the, the economies. And the one that is circled to the far top right shows you the ideal response where you have the introduction of the virus, it is contained quickly, and then you have a strong economic growth rebound. And this is what we all attain to do in terms of countries. However, this isn't, <clears throat> sorry, this isn't what actually occurs in practice. And so it depends on the measures, the policies and actions taken that will definitely um, show what result we will get where this is concerned. Then when we look at the social aspect, the stigma in the very beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, the uncertainty around the spread and how it is actually acquired definitely generated a lot of stigma because people fill their heads with a lot of weird, wonderful things. And this creates a stigma towards the disease. And this is something that could easily occur with the new or another um, pandemic. There are also issues related to gender in terms of the gender vulnerability that was exacerbated because of the current COVID-19 pandemic. These things existed before child abuse, exploitation, prostitution, um, the undue burden of care that is placed on women within families, be it their children or even sick relatives. All of this played a very key part um, in terms of the, the current COVID-19 pandemic. And so perhaps the expanding the roles of NGOs within countries can be useful in terms of aiding countries to share that burden. The technological aspect of it, I think this is where the current COVID-19 pandemic really showed how um, the world can come together and rapidly develop infection control tools from bioextractives to vaccines and biologics. But I think one key critical thing is that Caribbean ought to take away that we need to build a regional self-sufficiency. We need to also build up our digitalization drives to be able to streamline a lot of the processes and governance within the Caribbean as well. Then the emergence of the predictive models for infectious diseases really took center stage where countries were able to be using mathematical modeling, epidemiological models to create scenarios of the worst case situation that their country may be facing. And therefore they were able to then plan ahead before the virus actually entered their country and was able to spread. And we think that this is a very interesting um, outcome and something that should be really propelled 
into the future in terms of the entry and spread and, and using predictive models. Because let's face it, within the Caribbean, we have a heavy reliance on tourism. And therefore, that means the movement of people to and from all areas and corners of the globe, which also have inherent risk. And therefore, we need to be able to assess these risks and also predict what the worst case scenario could be for us here in the Caribbean. And there's also the emergence of non-invasive methods of surveillance. And interestingly, the interface between infectious diseases and chronic non-communicable diseases. So the underlying NCD burden within the Caribbean and across the globe, and, in, and, and overlaid on top of that, the emergence of novel infectious diseases. Also, with it relates to climate, the climate change and the influence of climate change on infectious diseases, we need to understand better because these things will continue to occur, the intensity and the severity will only increase. And therefore we need to know what the, the what these changes in climate translate to in terms of public health and infectious diseases. And our push for renewable energy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to turn to a greener economy will also be very critical. The issue of, sorry, the issue of ethics and the geopolitical influence of vaccine access. This has been a very key feature of the current COVID-19 pandemic in the Caribbean and in, um, in, in Barbados as well. The ability to, to quickly assess and also to acquire vaccines was a real, real huge issue. And this comes back and takes back into the point of pushing uh, for a, a, a regional biotech sector within the Caribbean to be able to to be self-sufficient. Also the issues of vaccine passport and testing certificate fraud and misappropriation of COVID-19 funding. These are all ethical issues that need and present ethical risks that we need to take into consideration. Also the legal aspect. Now biosecurity, the legislative frameworks within the Caribbean definitely need to be strengthened. This could include wastewater, wildlife, emergency order, disaster, you name it, ethics we have to do a better job because a lot of the existing legislation within the Caribbean is quite antiquated. Not all of it, but some of it. And these are glaring gaps that we definitely need to close. And therefore, within the Pasheel analysis, what we've looked at in the political aspect is that in the initial part of the pandemic, there was a very inconsistent regional approach and collaboration. But as the, uh, as the pandemic evolved, then we saw a more uh, closer and um, closely knit regional approach. And this, I believe, serves an area of improvement that we in the Caribbean can, can utilize, where we come together from the very outset to actually tackle such diseases and also to tackle the risk and the management of risk uh, where this is concerned. Due to the heavy dependency on, on tourism, we need to also expand our economic basis because we can see that an impact like this can really cripple the tourism industry and therefore we need to find other avenues to be able to bring in revenue and strengthen our GDP. Also increasingly um, increasing, sorry, the social safety network within our countries. Um, the governments can only cope with so much, but perhaps NGOs can fit within those gaps to help to supplement the social safety net. Weak cybersecurity, we need to, we need to um, get that um, covered. And I think we can see that that is quite clear on this particular call. Also the regional biotech sector, we need to create self-sufficiency. We have all the fauna and flora here in the Caribbean that is very diverse and we can utilize it and leverage it to actually propel us um, to not only be more self-sufficient where, where biotech is concerned, but also in terms of our um, economic revenue. Also, the issue of chronic diseases, that is something that we need to tackle. We are quite aware to improve food cell sufficiency. We also need to do that to leverage the green economy and the bio economy. We also have to try harder in the Caribbean to do that because that will lend resilience to what we are doing and what we can do to safeguard lives and livelihoods. Ethics, we need to strengthen ethical legislation. And where legislation is concerned, we have to do better as it relates to human wildlife interaction, invasive species, pollution, and several other key issues of legislation. 
And these are some of the leverage points that we, we see in terms of regional unity, economic diversification, strengthening of NGOs, uh, the biotech sector, biodiversity potential, economic potential, um, renewable energy, regional ethics body, hopefully we can get that going on a comprehensive regional legislative review. So in summary, we have touched on the redefinition of biosecurity and the adoption of a one life approach to expand from just simply the one health approach, but to incorporate several other key uh, facets that play a role in terms of determining risk and also the threats to lives and livelihoods. The PESIO tool, we've advanced this as one, one um, option that you can use and utilize. Uh, there are multiple to, to tackle in multiple threats to biosecurity in the Caribbean. And we know that infectious outbreak, disease outbreaks rather and pandemics will continue to emerge. And this is because humans, we as humans are a big part of the problem, and a, but we are also a big part of the solution. So risk communication and change communication will be critical in actually changing this so that we can close gaps and leverage the available opportunities. And this is our contact information should you desire to contact us. And I thank uh, HSG once again for the kind introduction. So on behalf of my colleagues, I have to, first of all, you know, state that they have done a lot of work in doing this and they wish they could have been here today. I, Sandy Murad, will be presenting on behalf of Dr. Darren Dukiram, and Dr. Darlene Franco on the immunology the effect, the impact on social media disinformation. We have to understand in the Caribbean region, just as of yesterday, if we looked, the vaccination rate of the world, if we use that as the average, it's about 60%. While across the, the Caribbean region, we will see from Belize down to Haiti, Trinidad and Tobago, there, the country where I'm from, are all under the world's average. While just a few, the British Virgin Islands, Antigua, Bermuda, Anguilla, uh, Barbuda, Anguilla, Bermuda, and the Cayman Islands are all above. What is very interesting with this is that Countries such as Cayman Islands, Bermuda, the British Virgin Islands, they all have some significant uh, backing uh, before, and it's something that we really need to research. But what it is showing is that the Caribbean region has reached a point with first getting vaccines in early February 2020, they have not been able to have a significant vaccine uptake as compared to the rest of the world. And we could potentially say that there is a vaccine hesitancy issue. If we just look at Trinidad and Tobago, for example, just to note what the previous speaker said, procurement of vaccines have been a major issue in the Caribbean region. We had issues surrounding uh, donations, where are we going to get vaccines? And basically, we in the Caribbean started getting vaccines around the 10th of February, initially starting with Barbados, where the previous presenter was, and then other countries started to get mainstream vaccines. There were some donations from Russia, and that asks a bigger question of the socio-political issues when it comes to vaccine access. However, on September the 13th, 2021, we had a major revelation by Nicki Minaj. My cousin Trinidad won't get the vaccine. Given all those issues I've talked about vaccine hesitancy, this came along the way. My cousin Trinidad won't get the vaccine because his friend got it and became impotent. His testicles became swollen. His friend was a week away from getting married. Now the girl called off the wedding. So just pray and make sure you are comfortable with your decision, not bullied. Now, someone reading this um, can have, for the first time, a 
significant guess that this can be true. It's coming from a very credible person. And what? let's investigate this person. So this person, none other than Mr. Minaj, actually at the point in time when he wrote this, had 22.8 million account followers on social media. Ms. Minaj actually retweeted, the post itself was retweeted 26,000 times with over 150,000 likes. News broadcasters such as BBC, CNN actually accelerated the story and the Minister of Health of Trinidad and Tobago were interviewed and quite, was interviewed actually, on quite a number of late night TV programs to discuss this issue, further adding fuel and prominence to this. And also the story eventually, after all of this reporting, could not have been verified. And in some cases was said to be false by the Minister of Health. So we have an unverified story, giving a lot of issues outside there, creating a lot of panic and taking up a lot of news time around the vaccine issue. And vaccine programs are really facing great challenges. In many countries, they have actually plateaued. So hence, our researchers decided to go upon doing a rapid review. A rapid review to be responsive to policymakers, to give a timely intervention, and also to bring a credible response to what is taking place there. Uh, we used the PICO system in developing the research question. And we looked at the population. Obviously, we want to find out about the population in the Caribbean, the, uh, the impact of vaccine hesitancy, and how social media has impacted on that. So how does social media impact on vaccine hesitancy in the Caribbean? Now, we all know rapid reviews has, have many limitations. We endeavored to search MBase, PubMed, and Google Scholar for the time period, 15th of September, 2021, I'm um, 2011, sorry, the 15th of September, 2021. We gave a 10 year time span of looking for information. We selected uh, articles that were strictly in English language. And three, two of our researchers worked in the public health system. And hence, we utilized them to have stakeholder consultations among terms, what would be the best um, terms that they would like to find out about. So they wanted to find out about the Caribbean region, what vaccine hesitancy is about there, and how the social media has it back. So we use the three terms. We cleaned it very quickly to look at Caribbean vaccine hesitancy in social media. And all articles were actually blind reviewed by the three researchers coming forward. When you look into PubMed, we found one article, but however, it didn't meet the geographic um, criteria. Embase, we actually had no um, access to Embase at this point, and hence we had to throw out the uh, utilizing of that database. While Google Scholar brought up 34 articles, many of them not meeting the geography, and many of them speaking to social media empowering actually um, vaccine um, hesitant, re reducing vaccine hesitancy. So it speaks about the converse, right? So given that we what we've really found nothing um, there you, in this rapid review. However, there were some important take home messages that came up in all of the literature. One, we need to engage influencers. Public health has really failed us at this point of the pandemic with not engaging influencers properly. These people have large followings and they are able to create great impact. The literature has shown influencers pushing the vaccine mandate does not necessarily increase the uptake of vaccines, however, it reduces the damage that they can potentially do by making irresponsible statements. And hence, we need to really engage them and get, get them involved. Two, 
encouraging irresponsible media. What we have found as well, that the media in this case has gone way and beyond in pushing a very trivial matter, which could have been ignored, and actually making it a big issue, running significant investigations, taking up times of ministers of health to discuss this very, very trivialized issue. And it could have been easily solved when one brings the research data to show that the vaccine did not, in from in many of the trials, cause hesitancy, no, um, sorry, caused these adverse events, as said earlier. And finally, we need to get digital innovations to solve digital problems. Immediately, we should be utilizing AI. And public health has to get more engaged on the AI, the AI outcomes. So for example, when this was placed up, there were many tweets by Ms. Menage asking for more and more information on vaccines and persons making the right choice. And when this tweet came up, immediately one should have, uh, AI should have picked it up and our public health experts need to get involved in this and engage again Ms. Menage. So, from that, although there's limited evidence on social media causing vaccine hesitancy in the Caribbean, more research needs to be done to understand this phenomena. This phenomena is not very well researched and it's something that we need to, to go forward with. Finally, one of the main limitations and it's methodological by nature, given the time frame and so on, the search was very limited and it, the nature of a rapid review is to give immediate information. Um, and as we give three suggestions there going forward. These are our references. And if you wish, it was published, um, the paper is, well, is in a redacted form, published in the Journal of Global Health. And i like from my other two co-presenters to thank you all very much. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Good morning, Daniel. Thank you to HSG for the invitation to join this important meeting. Let me just set up myself on this side. Right, okay. So this presentation is a collaborative work between a group of students undergraduate students and myself and Professor Ora. And we are from the U University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus, the School of Medicine and the School of Veterinary Medicine. So we're going to be looking at knowledge, awareness, perceptions and behavior of students at a Caribbean university towards climate change and its impact on human health. So climate change has been declared by the WHO as a global health problem. The most um, significant change and impact you will see circulating on the inner circle there, where we're looking at rising temperatures, um, increasing CO2 levels, rising sea levels, more extreme weather, all of these and, and um, their effects on the different exposures, which is the circle, um, the middle circle, all of these and the subsequent wide range health outcomes, which you'll see on the, let me use my pointer. Let me turn my pointer on so that you can see it. Right. Right, on the very outer, layer, you will see the health outcomes. And what this is showing us is that there are direct and indirect impacts, health outcomes from climate change. The very first speaker in this session gave 
an example in terms of biosecurity and what would be some of the impacts from climate change as it relates to biosecurity. So climate change is a major threat to global health. Now, as, con as countries continue to experience the double burden of disease alongside the emergence of new illnesses as we've seen with COVID-19, climate change continues to be a threat. And health systems need to respond with improved approaches. One of which is going to be ensuring that our future human resources is equipped to deal with the current and future global changes as it relates to health and the impact of climate change. So human resources, as we know, is one of the building blocks of our health systems. Now, according to Haynes in a paper that he wrote in 2017, climate action can lead to significant co-benefits by obviously preventing illness and addressing the different determinants of health. So the threat of climate change has actually driven um, calls for curriculum reform in universities, specifically in medical schools. Now, the International Federation of Medical Students Association did a global study in 2020, and they found that climate change on curriculums, um, those, those universities that reported that they had climate change on curriculums, on their curriculums was about 15% of medical schools globally. And of that, the climate change in some schools, about 12% of medical schools were actually led by students. So the, 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 the drive for the change in the curriculum is being pushed by students and we need to respond. The change has been slow and students are the ones that are advocating for the integration of climate change into our programs. So the links between climate change and health have been highlighted in the first slide. And this really underscores for us the need to prepare our medical students and health allied students with the knowledge and tools so that they can address and direct address both the direct and the indirect health impacts of climate change. So our study, our study objectives were to determine how knowledgeable final year university students are on climate change and its health impacts, and to identify factors contributing to their knowledge on climate change and those health impacts. impacts. Methods. So a cross-sectional study was conducted looking, um, looking at focusing on final year students, undergraduates across four faculties, the Faculty of Medical Sciences, Faculty of Social Sciences, so Faculty of Sciences and Technology, Faculty of Food and Agriculture, and the Faculty of Law. It was a cross-sectional study. We had ethics approval from the UWI Ethics Committee. And, UW, and the sample size we had was about 132 students. We used a convenient sample where it's snowball techniques and the self-administered questionnaire, which had 21 questions, was on social, was distributed via social media and emails. And we have to thank four deans in our various faculties who assisted in getting those questionnaires to our students. In terms of the results, we looked at knowledge of students on climate change by faculty. Um, all believe that climate change is actually happening. But when we looked across the faculty, about 11% of the students um, correctly identified that human activity is the main driver of climate change. 
And in terms of um, looking at individual faculties, we saw that the Faculty of Science and Technology were, um, were best able to identify with climate change and knowledgeable in climate change. Generally, knowledge, uh, knowledge about health impacts of climate change was fairly high across the, the, we had a range, mean score of about nine to 10 out of a maximum attainable score of 11. Then we looked at the perception of the effect of climate change on the prevalence of health issues. So we asked students, you know, how climate change would affect the prevalence of different health issues. And we can see that most of the respondents reported that illnesses due to reduced air quality hunger and malnutrition, disrupted healthcare services, mental health conditions were some of the, those that they thought would be affected um, more prevalently. We also looked at the connection with factors leading up to air, water and foodborne illnesses and chronic non-communicable disease was also more prevalent. coverage of climate change and health on the syllabus. So the, in the UWI curricula, um, we found that about 35.6 reported that there was coverage of climate change, while only about 18.2% covered health linkages with climate change. FMS, the Faculty of Medical Sciences, covered climate change the least, climate change and health connections the least, and um, FFA and FST covered climate change and health the most. We also asked students to indicate the coverage of, um, sorry, in terms of the, the, the coverage, about 30.5% of those were not in FMS compared to 3.3% in FMS reported that climate change and health things were covered on their practical curriculum. And about 60% of the non-medical sciences faculties versus about 7% in the Faculty of Medical Science reported that it was covered on the curriculum. We also inquired of students, what were their reporting sources of information outside of UWI, outside of what they knew in UWI. And um, considering those sources, the main source of information about climate change and health was from social media or from the media. And that media included about 34% social media and about 30% mass media. So limited knowledge um, of the relationship was reported. Let me rephrase that. When they were asked about if they had learned about climate change and or health, but not about their relation, um, the majority reported that they had not learned about that particular relation. They weren't able to give a source for that. So we looked, in, in looking through the results, and we've only given you just a snapshot, in looking through, looking at the results, we recognize that anthropogenic causes of climate change were not well understood in terms of the extent that students were able to link climate change and health. It was link it to climate change. It was not fully appreciated the human impact on climate change. General awareness was present um, of the likely impact that climate change would have on health issues, including NCDs, even though that was um, reported to a lesser prevalence. We noted that um, FMS was most aware of mental health impacts of climate change when compared to the other faculties. Now there's no dedicated course on climate change in Faculty of Medical Sciences, students get an introduction to 
One Health, but there's no dedicated course that really focuses in on climate change and its health impact. In about 2017 and 2018, um, researchers out of Columbia University, they, and about, they, they conducted a survey with members of the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education. And about 59 schools were researching, about 80% reported that student interest was a major factor in establishing the curricula as it related to climate and health. Now, in our other non-FMS, those are the non-medical faculties, their course outline, their, their courses, their course outlines, they have course outlines that do cover climate change, but they did not give any indication if that coverage included the health links. So curriculum coverage, is inconsistent across the faculties at the university and students climate change knowledge tend to be informed by um, the media. So going forward, one of the things that we have to appreciate is that in small island developing states like Trinidad and Tobago and the rest of the Caribbean, we have to look at the WHO's operational framework for building climate resilient health systems. Our students have exhibited really high levels of knowledge about health impacts of climate change. However, the knowledge primarily seems to be coming from the media. We have, to, we have a duty of care where we need to ensure that climate change and health is included into the curricula at UWI particularly at the faculty of FMS. Daniel, if you're sending me a message, I'm actually not seeing it on my popping up. So in the framework, in the revised framework as relates to the health, the building blocks of the health systems, climate change has been incorporated for us to have a more resilient health systems. So our medical and other health allied students need to be trained in terms of the connections between climate change and health. They are our next human resources for us to have a climate resilient health system. Knowledge and perceptions are driven by media. We need to change that. So there's an urgent curricular revision that is needed across all our faculties because we are integrating to have a, a wide human resource as it relates to medical and allied health. We should also consider having standalone courses to incorporate and involve those who are already in the profession and require continuing medical education. So I will stop at this point and hand back over to Daniel, but I just need to acknowledge all the students that participated or faculty deans and the administrative staff that assisted with this project. Okay, let me begin again. As I said, it's uh, who the team is. And I'm saying that since uh, the offset of the COVID-19, there have been exponential uh, infection. As such, many studies have shown that there are psychological problems with nurses. For instance, New Zealand mental health struggle, USA have shown paranoia anxiety. Evidence also showed anxiety in uh, Ontario. And um, basically, you find that nurses suffer from mental exhaustion, emotional problems, and many other psychological distress. Also, there is a high risk of anxiety syndromes. There's also post-traumatic problems, burnout, 
and suicidal tendencies. Here lies the problem. Locally, uh, there is evidence of the psychological impact of COVID-19 on nurses. However, there is no local study to determine its prevalence or burden. Here lies the question. What is the impact of caring for our clients with COVID-19 on the psychological status of nurses who work at public hospitals in region three and four? The purpose of this study is to garner environmental support, coping abilities and psych psychological, uh, to cope with psychological challenges affecting nurses who care for these clients with COVID-19. The methodology. The second is the, okay, we're using a mixed approach and a cross-sectional design. It will be conducted, it was conducted in Diamond Diagnostic Center, uh, which has a population of 40 nurses, Lillian Dahl, which has a population of 30 nurses, De Demoir, uh, West Demoir Hospital, 100 nurses, and the Georgetown Public Hospital Corporation. These centers were chosen because these are places where nurses look after persons with COVID-19. It has a population of 500, I'm not seeing the slide, 559 nurses in a total. Uh, the inclusion criteria was that the nurses must not be, uh, must be persons who provide care for COVID-19 patients and they can communicate using the Google Classroom software. Also, the inclusion the exclusion criteria is that they must not have been previously diagnosed with any kind of mental illness. We did cluster sampling. We collected the data via the uh, Google Classroom platform so as to go in times with the with not infecting the persons who were collecting the data or infecting the, the clients who we, we approach. Data analysis was done using the SPSS software and um, version 23. Uh, basically, the descriptive statistics was done, was car were carried out on the data. Here, we look at indiv independent variables based on our conceptual framework. And the, the independent variables were uh, environmental, demographics, age, uh, status, and the professional uh, position. We also look at interventions like PPE, screening, physical activities, structural interventions like counseling and so on and so forth. We looked at stressors such as duty, environmental and work conditions, uh, internal and external. The dependent variables were psychological distress, uh, symptoms of suicidal tendencies and depressive symptoms. Now, from this, you can see our instrument and the instrument has, um, Sociodemographic variables, six questions, eight questions, uh, psychosocial distress, uh, the PSQ uh, questionnaire, and work environment. Also, intervention questions, and the numbers are stated there. Uh, now, the study was conducted uh, between 2021, January to December. Now the findings here. One hundred and seventy-six nurses participated in the study. One hundred sixty-two were females. The major, the male model age was 26, 20, 20 to twenty-six years, and that was about seventy-eight or forty-five percent of the population. Uh, one hundred fifty-six were registered nurses. And 140, which is 65%, worked in the COVID transition areas. All these nurses cared for persons who were affected by COVID-19. 55.8% of them were quarantined at one time or another. Uh, so when we, when we ask them questions about environmental supportive uh, mechanisms, the responses show that inad inadequate staffing are cited by 85% of the nurses. 68% said that PPE was adequate. And we can say that this corresponds with uh, RIA 2021 about people having adequate PPE. Uh, 
increased duration of work shift. 69% of nurses claim that, and that ties in with a study done by Moetal 2020. Uh, no physical health programs were available, as cited by 81% of the nurses. They also claim that the media did not support their professional image, and that was 74%. Uh, further, when asked about interventions, the majority said that there were no intervention programs, no screening programs, no access to therapists, or no health promotion programs for them. Uh, we looked at the patient health questionnaire, and you would notice from this display that depression was felt by a lot of nurses uh, several days. And this figure is very high in comparison to other studies. When we look at suicidal tendencies on this, uh, on this area, we find that more than 20% 20, 20 of the sample had uh, suicidal tendencies. And uh, this is another serious fact to note, which surpasses what I've noticed in the literature we review. When we look at the psychological conditions experienced by the nurses, you will note that a number of nurses are fearful, unhappy. They find it difficult to enjoy daily activities and also their daily work suffering. Now, this part of the uh, questionnaire would have had quantitative items because we would have used quantitative items, qualitative items, and also we will have used a focus group discussion to go deeper into phenomena. So uh, severity of the problems. In order to look at the severity of the problems, we looked at we use uh, qualitative items. And we would have noted that 25% of the sample uh, claim to have had stress disorder because we are asking them to rate their psychological problems, the three most severe ones that they suffered. And 25% said it would have been stress and depression. Uh, the next one coming in there next to that would have been in some, it was surprising that it was not anxiety, as would have been uh, out in other studies. The nurses were asked to uh, show their interventions that um, were there and how they feel about it. Now, 45% claim that the interventions there had no positive effect. Some also claim that the environment was not safe and um, they claim that it does not decrease any anxiety or um, fear, that 19%, but there were some people who were saying that yes, they have some positive effects also. Uh, counseling, we asked them what inter interventions they would like to see in a qualitative way, and 63% rated for counseling. And this here goes in co with Chenetal 2000, who said that counseling is very effective. Also, adequacy of PP, and that was also the like, concordable findings of Binwati 2020. Risk allowance was the third uh, area that was cited. Uh, negative effects, there were some negative effects that nurses cited has to do with the uh, psychological intervention. Some said that there were no negative effects and that would have been 66%. However, some cited breach in confidentiality, discrimination, and so forth. So uh, even though they're saying that, yes, we must have uh, these programs, they cited that there are going to be some problems along with the programs if we should have it. In conclusion, 
Nurses express that stress, depression, and fear affect them mostly as they provide care for clients with COVID-19. Next, the patterns of depressive symptoms appears to surpass the patterns noted in previous studies. Next, PPP is largely adequate, but mental support for nurses appears to be insufficient, inaccessible. Sufficient and inaccessible. Recommendations. For the studies that are to be done in this area, review policies, programs, and practices designed to promote the psychological needs of nurses, and final recommendation, enforcement, monitoring, and evaluation of support programs for nurses during the pandemic. Thank you.